What's happening, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Crash Bang Boom Drumming Podcast. And how the hell might y'all be making out? Having issues distinguishing one day from the other? Well, it happens to the best of us. Today's guest is John Syverson of Daughters. John and I last spoke when Daughters were playing some relatively small shows in support of their new album at the time, and you won't get what you want. And witnessing the increasing venues with every New York visit, coupled with a busy tour schedule that followed the release of the record, I figured it'd be cool to catch up and uh, just see what in the hell John had been up to the last year and a half. We also talked about the new Alexis Marshall solo record John played drums on, and I can only hope to hear that one soon. So hope y'all enjoy it. Crash Bang Boom podcast can be found on my SoundCloud and YouTube page, as well as Google Play, Podbean, Stitcher, Luminary, and more. Check out my Facebook and Instagram pages for additional content and updates. Please give me a like and or a subscription, a follow, etc. if you could. The support is appreciated. Shout out to my sponsor, New Orleans Record Press, who's pressing the hell out of records presently. Has a quicker turnaround time than most and can help you with everything from design to mastering, electroplating, vinyl coloring options, packaging, and more. They even got that handy little real-time quote generator to remind you of just how expensive it is to actually print records. But that shit sounds good. It even smells good. So get up on it. That's New Orleans Record Press. Keep your eyes and ears peeled for artists offering lessons online, master classes, workshops, etc., as well as fundraisers, charities, and GoFundMes that are all helping both venues navigate this ever-challenging time, as well as the fight to make the world a better place and assist those in the actual streets fighting to make said world a better place. We're all going to have to pull each other together in this tough time. In any case, here we go. John Syverson, part two. Crash, bang, boom. Crowds go mad with joy. Yep, 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 yep. John Syverson, part two. What's happening, man? How are you doing? What's been going on? <laughs> Hello, sir. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, fuck. <laughs> exactly. I don't know when this thing's going to go away, but what's what's going on? I feel like in February, I think I had a life. Right. And since then, it's just been a haze, maybe. Totally. But, um, I mean, there's good things and bad things. But I have been just visiting my couch and uh, <laughs> daydreaming about anything else but what I'm uh, getting updates on. So Yeah. I don't know, man. Just hanging in there, right? Just flapping in the breeze. Yeah, the dude. Day. Yeah, man. And you're still you still down in Austin, Texas. Yep. And uh, you know things are just getting getting special right now with uh, this virus. I don't know if you've heard about it. There's a virus going around. Yeah, I moment. heard a little something and, uh, about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's getting it's getting bad. Like we shut down again last week. Right. So if everybody's kind of panicking and. Or denial. Everyone's mad. It's yeah. It sucks. <laughs> I hear you, man. I don't know but, if you've had them before, uh, but I've talked about it previously on another episode. But the the frozen avocado margarita margaritas that you can get in Austin are incredible. Have you had these things before? No. Tell me more. Uh, well, <laughs> I, that's honestly it's it's what it is. I'll have to look up where I got them and get back to you on that. I I forget exactly where it was. Uh, it's like a little Mexican diner, and then another place that I went to does it. So it's kind of a thing in Austin. I had them at two different places, and it's literally blended avocados into like a frozen margarita, and it's it's fucking glorious. <laughs> well, I mean, it sounds good, and for some reason, I'll, I'll think I'm doing something responsible and healthy. Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, <laughs> for a, yeah, mixing it up. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, my biggest, I mean, since I saw you last, I had my second son. I just turned 44 not too long ago. And in the meantime, I'm just uh, trying not to lose my liver and or go broke and or die. So, you know, those, those are the options. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. And uh, I feel like I'm worried in a way, but <laughs> congratulations. Yeah, man. I tell you what, when you are just not working and looking after my son in this case and taking him out to the park, and then the next thing I know, like a buddy shows up and we do happy hour drinks while he runs around and runs around with sticks and, uh, you know, try not to lose the child and have a little happy hour drink and then go home and rinse and repeat. And once again, like we were talking about a little bit earlier, man, the Groundhog's Day level of this whole experience is so outrageous. I see the same people in the same park walking by with their dogs at the same time wearing the same clothes they see us me and my buddy having some drinks with my son running around with sticks every day it's the same it's uh the redundancy is is just outrageous yeah i mean i feel like it's important to maybe try a routine yeah but 
I don't know. It's, then again, I'm kind of like, why? I could just <laughs> sit here. And then uh, both, either route, you know, starts to get confusing and weird after a certain point. So, totally. Yeah. I hear you, man. Slapping in the breeze, man. Yeah, dude. Music's a thing still. Or is it? Yeah. I mean, when do I stop calling myself a musician? Yeah, right? Because, uh, I mean, I was. But I could be delivering pizzas yeah. you could be delivering pizzas uh, you could go Beatles or Steely Dan style and just be a, a recording artist and uh, you'd still be a musician you you know I think but yeah the whole idea is uh, as you know well it's getting out and doing it is part of the deal and if you can't do that well it seems kind of fucked up yeah yeah it's uh, it is weird there are some bands that are you know just doing the bold step of going online and yeah that's not really my thing and yeah. it's doesn't really look good to me i guess some people like it right but right i don't know and i don't know what cover bands are doing right now either but uh yeah <laughs> i think music everywhere is entertainment everywhere is, it's interesting that i feel like everybody's in the same spot it's not just one sort or one class everybody for the most part is completely affected by this one way or another right yeah, it is a great equalizer in that sense. We uh, there we can all have a shared experience to, to varying degrees, uh, obviously, but that is the, the great equator, I feel like, with this. I want to go see live music and have drinks and hug dudes. I'm ready to do this already, man. Jesus Christ. Yeah, I want to get back to my irresponsible, reckless self. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, there are a few things that have been beneficial with the whole, like, off-switch like somehow I kind of fell back in love, like not since I was a teenager with just drums and reworking my idea about music. And that's been actually pretty fun yeah. to go through again. And I'm not sure if uh, that really made sense to you, but mm-hmm. I'm actually like sitting down and taking in music and listening. And there's a lot of good shit out there and coming out. So, yeah. I've had both the time to do that and and listen to records and and do all that, which I guess I was doing a pretty good bit of initially as well. But uh, for me, I've been able to allocate, even if it's 45 minutes to ride my bike and go practice every day leading up. And I had a friend where we had a barter system where I I edited some videos for him and then he recorded some drums for me. So I've actually been, I've recorded drums for two different projects. So I've got a bunch of projects like in in the works. So I've been able to kind of focus on that stuff and really kind of get myopic about it and not think uh, so much about work and just uh, pretend that I'm doing this as a living uh, and I just have to then be a parent as well. That's the only thing. If I didn't, if I didn't have kids, then I'd be like, it'd be a whole different ball game. But uh, yeah, it's been, it's, I've been able to make, I think, the best of it uh, thus far. So I'm feeling pretty good about it, all things considered. Yeah, no, likewise. You know, um, what can we do? Right. But uh, I don't, I don't want to do the whole just getting angry like everybody else seems to be and right. going to hell in a handbasket with everybody, you know, naysayers. Right. And so trying to live in my bubble and uh, just to kind of push out the outside world, but yeah. at the same time, I don't know. That's kind of dangerous. It's, uh, right, totally. Who fucking knows? I know, man. It's trippy, man. You know, uh, the the last since the last time I talked to you, I was kind of thinking about the trajectory of daughters and y'all putting out uh, You Won't Get What You Want and and uh, it's, it's interesting because, you know, the, the, when we talked, y'all played Brooklyn Bazaar and then St. Vitus the next night. I think St. Vitus is like 150, 175 max capacity, I believe. Then the next time Daughters came back, I saw you at Warsaw and that's a thousand capacity. And then Brooklyn Steel, uh, the, and then that's, that's like 1800 capacity. So it was really interesting kind of seeing the trajectory of, of bigger and bigger shows and people becoming more and more interested and just the whole thing kind of expanding off of that record and having spoken to you about the way that y'all recorded it and the way that you did it. For those listening to this, feel free to check out the previous episode. But uh, just tell me a little bit about the wild ride uh, since the last time I talked to you, because I feel like y'all did a lot of shows, toured a lot. And as I said, from a New York uh, perspective, it seemed like it kept getting bigger and bigger. I mean, yeah, somehow... One day I was just like, whoa, this stage is way bigger than the last one I was on. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, I I got to say, I, you know, I didn't expect uh, that to happen. I was totally cool with St. Vitus forever. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I guess I, something happened. People wanted to go, and we needed places that were big enough to let them in. 
because yeah. it would suck to it would suck to go outside after the show and people are out there that couldn't and uh, it's like yeah. wow that's never been a problem before right so uh looks like no one's prepared for it but then the next thing is what big venue actually wants to book us so it was just you know yeah. there was some growing pains for sure but uh, i was looking back it's surreal for sure you know i didn't i didn't expect that to happen i still have a hard time being like did we actually pull it off cuz yeah. some of those are big fucking places for <laughs> for that band you know but totally. i guess we did yeah i guess we did but yeah it was Totally interesting, man. I mean, we put a ton of fucking work in that year. Right. We upgraded in venues slightly. Mm-hmm. And uh, who knows, man? It could be a, a big, far fall back to uh, basements, but I'm looking forward to that, too. I don't care. I just want to play at this point. So. Right. Wow, man. What are some of the more memorable shows that, that you all might have played, be it uh, wherever, uh, that, that really strike your memory as being pretty pretty awesome? Well, that uh, that Brooklyn Steel show. Yeah, I couldn't see the back of the room, you know. And right. I was just like, "Fuck, uh, do they know what band this is?" <laughs> it's like, <laughs> did they did they screw up on the advertising? You know, it's just kind of like disbelief. And then, at a certain point, I started realizing, like, "Oh shit!" I, like, I can kind of screw up in a small bar, and everyone kind of sees it, and you know, everyone kind of it's weird connection you have with the audience. They understand if you break a stick or. Missed a part and totally. the guitar player gives you a face. Everyone kind of, you know, smirks at that. Um, when you're in a big fucking venue and you can't even see the the first person in the audience's face very well. Right. If you fuck up, you just feel shame in a way. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, I feel like I'm putting on a, a performance now where as before just felt like, I don't know, a show. Uh-huh. So there was kind of a weird responsibility to being on as much as I could, you know, this weird pressure that I had to deal with at first. Mm-hmm. I just, you know, there's a thing about whiskey that kind of makes you numb to that. So right, <laughs> uh, whiskey comes in and then you just, your memory has to not fade away with it. But right. Yeah. I don't know, man. It's, um, I'm proud of the year. It, it's almost unbelievable in a way, you know, yeah. disbelief, like started the year in a van that could barely, uh, make it and ended in a bus. Right. How? I don't know. But, uh, at the same time, uh, shit, I just, I want to get another record going and I want to do it again. Like so many other bands that I know. Right. And we were lucky by ending our touring before the shutdown. Right. You know, I know bands that were like in Europe ready to go. Right. Already spent a ton of money on things trying to recoup and they mm. had to just get home yeah. and uh, who knows how much they owe whoever. Right. So that's, I mean, it's just, it sucks to think about yeah. But I feel like when bad things happen, sometimes uh, that used to motivate me to just write weirder, more fucked up music as, I don't know, some kind of trait to survive something terrible. Right. So I I kind of hope that, you know, everybody that kind of went through something and is in a hardship can turn it into something somehow, get that energy out, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, with all those shows that we were just talking about you doing, and it sounds like there were really some awesome ones over the course of it. And, and of course, you know, just from kind of talking to you the last time, you know, I mean, from a band that, that started out, you know, about 17 years ago or, or even more, you know, looking at the progression from something like Canada songs and then hell songs and then daughters, and then you won't get what you want. Uh, it's such an amazing progression. And then on that record of all records, the last one, people really attached to it and it was really cool to see that but i guess uh with lex's physical performance style and and nick's and and just really the whole band how were y'all holding up physically throughout all of those shows well there was uh, definitely some aches pains and there was some scares you know lex had to go get a, some x-ray like he had to find a specialist on tour and then fly out to it and really we've never canceled yeah we've never canceled a show but he was in a lot of pain for a while there. What was wrong with him? What, he slipped a disc or something oh. wild. Like he was, it was real pain. You know, yeah. he was kind of counting the days. But when he got on stage, he went for it still. Right. So, you know, it, it, at that point, it's just like, how long am I going to injure myself for? For real, you know, yeah. the tour will end. But when we were kids, we could, you know, we could take a punch and uh, just keep rolling. Who oh, cares? But yeah. I guess it gets to a point where injuries are actual. Oh shit, I'm really injured, you know? Right. And it's, yeah, it's just things like that. I think we maybe did too many shows. We were just so fucking tired at certain points. 
Right. You know, they're still booking us the way we want to get booked, which is a show almost every day. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, we can't even get up. We can't move. You know, we're all cranky. <laughs> we're like, wow, why are we? Why are we crank? We're on tour. This should be great. Yeah. I just want to go to bed, and we can't. So you know, I guess we just noticed those things when we're when we think we're being idiots is what we noticed. And uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe the schedule is too rough for a while, but we survived it and tried our best. You know, there was we did a lot of Europe, and definitely weren't expecting the the noise issues that we we confronted. Like being in a small place and not able to turn up because there's like a noise restriction. Wow! And the laws had changed, and it came down. And we had a sound guy that was really good with that, and he's used to touring with other really noisy, loud bands. Mm-hmm. So he's a uh, and he's got a lot of tricks as to how to, to cheat it. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if I should go into that, but I, fuck it, I will. <laughs> yeah. There's something about the mic that there's basically at, at the soundboard, there will be a like a meter that tells you how loud the band, the band sure. is. And if you spray a little hairspray over that mic, you know, sometimes it can harden, sort of affect how much sound gets into that mic. Bizarre. And, uh, you know, yeah, a couple panning tricks and stuff. But we were into places that, Really, this is like, I think an acoustic guitar sets Oof. off the, uh, go, it goes over the limit. Like my snare without a mic was going over it. Oh. Yeah, so still want to play those cities. We saw Sleep in that same city in Switzerland. I forget what it is. Mm. I'm like, if Sleep can fucking do it, yeah, uh, anyone can do it. Absolutely. And Yeah, and it was weird. But at the same time, I guess you got to remember everybody there is used to it that way. Yeah, so, that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah, I mean, so things like that, just, you know, um, uh, growing into uh, big boys, I guess, in a way. <laughs> yeah, man. Dealing with real band things. Totally. Did you end up uh, doing any sort of adjustments uh, with your setup or anything like that to uh, address any pain-related issues that you were having with so many shows? Or did you find that you needed to alter anything ergonomically or, or anything like that, necessarily? Well, the first time something, like is happening to me like I'm usually in pain and I'm like I might need to change something Mm -hmm. and then I don't know because because I'm an idiot I usually do the wrong thing first right right like oh well that would be cool and now it's like (laughs) don't be cool you can't fucking lift your left arm anymore so I mean what what was happening to me was also weird like I I had to move up two sizes in drumsticks which was just weird Hmm. but you know I just I just went for it and now I'm up thicker sticks and then it was just like, Oh, you're going through symbols and heads and everything. Right. So then it was figuring out all that. And yep. you know, that's where I was like, well, that head would be cool. You know what? No, it's not. It's uh you gotta, unless you want to come home broke because of drum heads, you know, well, I can't pay rent, but maybe he takes drum heads, you know, right. that doesn't work too well. Oh my God. But, um, I mean, yeah, it's just, yeah, I also have to, uh, we're playing like an hour, sometimes an hour plus. Mm-hmm. I got to be ready to uh, actually get up there and do it for an hour, which is uh, and daughters for years was what a fifteen minute show. Totally, <laughs> that could be fifteen songs. So. Right. Wow. Yeah, there was a lot of dust to blow off, man. I believe it. Yeah, I mean, doing a set four times the length, uh, it's something that I've spoken about both in playing longer songs, longer duration songs, or even slower songs, or especially playing a longer set. You really have to adjust to that so much and be really careful not to blow your load because I've certainly been so excited and amped up and anxious to play that I jump up. And uh, even if it's a 35-minute set, within the first song, I realize that I've... I did, maybe I didn't hydrate. Maybe I didn't stretch right. I don't know what I did. What I, what I did, what I did wrong necessarily. But my hands feel as though there's a little bit of concrete in in them, and they it, it's uh, it's kind of painful. And uh, and you have to sort of play through it, and then eventually I've had my body adjust to it. But yeah, playing an hour set would be uh, definitely an adjustment. So I get where you're coming from for sure on that. Yeah, and when you're headlining, which we we mostly headlined. I guess you kind of meet the uh, people working the club a little more intimately. Uh-huh. And that's where uh, if you're kind of a, a cranky prick like we were on some mornings <laughs> loading in, uh, that's where, you know, they kind of come back to get you during the show. <laughs> right. And uh, I get it. Yeah, there's no reason to be a jerk to anybody. I'm, I'm not saying that's who we were, but there were some times where you just couldn't put up with some comments, you know, mm-hmm. just like – 
yo, man, it's not cool to say that. Like, don't say that to this person. Yeah. You know, treating us like we're stupid because, you know, this guy that just, he comes in with a, uh, you know, not knocking journey, but for instance, a journey shirt and a bunch of laminates on his uh, <laughs> on his belt. It's like, wow, this guy's got a laminate for every festival he's ever done since 86 on. You know, he's in right. his... In his 60s, he's doing monitors, and all he wants to do is talk and give you advice. But if you have conflicting ways of doing this, mm-hmm. now you're sort of battling him. Mm-hmm. And it's it, it's cute for a second, but <laughs> after after a while, you're like, wow, man, I mean, can we please sound check? Like that Brooklyn um, Bazaar show that we did that interview at, we had a, we had a sound guy there that just kind of destroyed it for us man it was it was pretty funny you know yeah he, uh, what time are doors like five minutes uh if people show up here i'll turn on the pa it's like you didn't turn on the pa at soundcheck no nah, i didn't didn't need it well it's sold out oh really yeah, you know it's just right and during the show arguing with us yelling at me through the monitors like that's a new thing for me Yo, usually oh we're God. in and out and thank you very much <laughs> but again there's a difference between staff at a place like vitus where you're probably fast friends and it's fun. Everything's a drink at the bar and then you load out and go mm-hmm. to uh, kind of more corporate venues. Right. So, I don't know. Yeah. Most of it was cool, but it's just another thing. Right. It's funny you mentioned the uh, the Brooklyn Bazaar show. I guess I can say it now that that uh, venue is no longer a thing, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately. But yeah, the sound uh, could be quite rough in that place. And y'all that night in particular, I remember thinking the show is great. The sound is a little little crazy to, uh, to me. And I, I it was not y'all. I think it was the, the whatever was going on behind the scenes there. But then the next night, I saw y'all for for the second time, obviously, in uh, at Vitus, and it sounded incredible. Oh man, it was so badass. It was like. Uh, such a great show and and so intimate like you were talking about you know it's great yeah i want to i guess i want to be clear because we are on uh, this is a podcast uh the regular guy for brooklyn bazaar was he called in last minute ah. so we got you know a, a sub and ah. uh i just want to be clear about that because uh yeah. that dude is, is rad and i was looking forward to him mixing us there but gotcha you know that's and that's what happens sometimes. Right, right, right. But yeah, I had the same anger snare. <laughs> right, you <laughs> definitely one. did. It like, sounded like, wild, dude. I was like, what the fuck is through, going on with this snare? It was just all <laughs> all bottom mic. For totally. Whatever reason. Totally. It really was, man. Oh, it was killing me, especially as a drummer. I was like, what the fuck's going on? Oh, that's unfortunate. But hey, the the show was still great, and uh, I didn't let the same anger snare uh, drive me too crazy. I still enjoyed what y'all were doing enough to look past it. I no, appreciate it. Yeah, dude. That's where you're a good guy. There you go, buddy. <laughs> uh, let me ask you this, man. I know the last time we spoke as well, and even outside of your work with Daughters, uh, uh, to my understanding, you had been doing uh, uh, tour managing. So I guess uh, my question would be, as those shows got bigger, as we were referencing earlier, did you continue to do the tour managing as well? And was that something that was becoming harder and harder to deal with? I was able to um, put people in... Uh, positions for me gotcha. and everyone was pretty understanding you know i mean nobody saw it coming like whoa you're some people are like well you play drums yeah where are you uh where are you gonna play when you're in town i'd tell them the name of the venue and they'd be like whoa okay so it's not like a, a hobby or cover band or something yeah and, and people supported me pretty good I, I i mean if people start touring again maybe i'll get a phone call one day to to do it and i'll do it when i can yeah i enjoy that it's just I, I enjoy people going and doing their thing and you just help them do it. And I think I have a pretty decent insight from being in a band and knowing totally. what we need. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of a, not a lot of tour managers have ever been in touring bands. Right. It, it seemed to help me. So mm-hmm. yeah, I was able to do it when I could, but you know, exhaustion becoming, becoming a thing. Right. Like I went right from, I went right from Europe to India to do a tour. Ooh. So six weeks in Europe with daughters and then straight to India for like 11 dates and then right back to daughters for rehearsals for upcoming. At, at the end of the rehearsals, we had a small, that's where I really felt just destroyed. Wow. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I shouldn't complain at all. It was, I was having the time of my life. I just don't know how to rest properly. I guess <laughs> I, could, I couldn't find sleep or something. Like what right. a thing to be upset about, but yeah. I guess I felt my my age, or who knows, man. Yeah. Did you get sick at any point during that, any of those shows? Surprisingly, my my health somehow, I guess, 
kept up. That's impressive. Yeah, uh, most of the year. I don't know. Yeah, usually I get sick pretty fast on tour managing gigs, but yeah. I'm usually around a bunch of techs who just, you know, do fucking crazy shit all the time, so <laughs> who knows, but... Yeah, I mean that's one thing we we got you know we got each other sick at one point, but that was it. And uh, usually it's much worse, but yeah. So yeah, we, we were lucky there. Wow. Uh, well, I know Chris from Mets was on base for a little stretch there in 2019, I believe it was. Uh, is Sam back as the bass player in the band, or do y'all have a solid bass player presently? Well, Sam had a uh, child like halfway through the ah. touring, and he also, you know, daughters stopped and he you know landed a career and uh it was something he worked really hard for and it's one of those positions where if he was to give it up he might not be lucky enough to get back in that position again yeah so it was just like like, we'll do the fill-in thing you know he's still a part of the band and uh he did one stretch with us just before he had the, the kid and that was a lot of fun yeah. And watching him also like get used to a, a 60 minute set after we've been doing it for about six months was, was also funny too, but yeah, you know, either, <laughs> either way. Um, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where life happens, you know? Um, mm-hmm. so we just kind of did, did the fill in thing. And, uh, Chris, he's such an angel. He was a lot of fun to be around. And, um, we had, uh, our friend John Huss from, um, he was in, lives in Paris. He, he did some of it. And our friend, uh, Monica, she, uh, she did bass for the last stretch. Gotcha. Wow, man. Filling in. Everybody filling it in to make it happen. Yeah. And, and it's weird because you get all these new people around and the dynamic changes. And right. Then you start to kind of wonder, like, why do they want to be around us? We're kind of psychopaths. But, you know, <laughs> cool. They, they haven't left yet. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah, I think when I think about the chemistry and just the personalities between you, Nick, and Lex, uh, it's it's – Part of what makes, I think, that band so exciting, but uh, also I imagine as, as the new person coming into that uh, and being uh, at the time, you know, in the crossfire, so to speak. Not to say that y'all were, you know, having disagreements or anything, but yeah, I imagine that it would be uh, crazy. I think that would, I, I can tell that there's some strong personalities, I, I guess you could say. <laughs> oh, it shows. <laughs> you can tell. Well, yeah, there'd be, there'd be some moments where, I, you know, after half the tour i just kind of have to do a little check-in with them you know hey so how are you doing do you hate us (laughs) right (laughs) but yeah i mean everyone was cool i guess we kept it together enough to stay appealing and no one took off on us you know yeah so i get good for us gold star there yeah i guess absolutely well, speaking of Lex, tell me a little bit about uh, this solo record that you worked on him and the process and getting it together and some of the specifics about how that went down and drumming and the, the whole thing. I'm interested to hear about it. It was trippy, man. I've been living off podcasts since everything shut off. Mm-hmm. And I've been getting into uh, yours. Nice. And just with my the story of the Lex, how I kind of got thrown into and what I had to do, Um yeah, that's why I texted you. Yeah. I was the needy one. I was like, I'm going to talk to somebody about this. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, yeah, let everyone know I asked you to talk to me. That's I'm right. I am, I guess. I was, I was all about it. So Lex, you know, is kind of beating around the bush saying he's writing demos and this and that. And it's like, that's cool. Um, right on, man. And then he, you know, calls me up and says, hey, what are you doing in two weeks? You want to record? R- record what, man? Oh, my, my solo thing. Oh, yeah, for sure, man. What do we, uh, can you send me music? Yeah. What do you mean, yeah? He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like, he didn't send me a thing. Oh, and God. It was pretty awesome. Yeah, but at the <laughs> same time, like, I do know he's somehow going to complete it, you know? He's not going to fall on his face. Mm-hmm. But he doesn't want me to hear music. There's probably, a, like, a calculated reason. So mm-hmm. here I am, I show up, and uh, we have... Um, Evan Patterson, who's J. Jail, Young Widows, and uh, Kristen from Lingua Ignota are there. And I'm, you know, hey, you guys get any demos or anything? <laughs> nope. <laughs> Whoa. Cool. Well, here we go. And uh, Lex, ha- he's like, hey, I'm going to Guitar Center and then Home Depot. And we're like, cool. We sent him a list of things we needed because he had been there working a few days before we arrived. Uh huh. Turns out he didn't go to Guitar Center. He just went to Home Depot for everything. I'm like, well, what kind of shit can you get there? And that's pretty much the percussion I got would be like, you know, the, the rain gutters, the one that bend at the top and go uh-huh. into the gutter. The, yeah. You know, and 
bunch of those on a chain was one of my drum tools. Nice. A couple sheets of aluminum with a bunch of pennies nice. uh, that were you know supposed to be dropped on them. Uh, so a bunch of that stuff. And I'm like, yeah, awesome. Um, the drum kit was set up for me. So I had like a marching drum with a with a tambourine kind of flopped over the front. Uh-huh. And the idea was you can only hit it so often. The tambourine has to be allowed to come back and crash into it. So I got to pick the notes I'm going to use on the kick drum very carefully. Wow. I can't just kind of go for it. Um, not allowed to use sticks. I've got a brush and one of those plastic rod sticks. Whoa. Um, hi-hat is a just a stack, and the ride cymbal is just a stack. Uh, floor tom is a floor tom. Mm-hmm. So that that's the only thing that you know I'm used to yeah, using. Yeah, traditional the snare drum. drum head. <laughs> what do you call those little uh, cymbals that are in a tambourine? What are those? Oh, you know, that's a good question. I, I know what you're talking about, but I don't know specifically what you would even call that. Sure. Well, those were on the snare, so I also had to watch how often I hit the snare because wow. the idea was those crash back down on the snare and move around. So, you know, restricted, but I also – he didn't want me to think about the way I'm used to doing drums at all. Right. And he didn't want me to – he didn't really want me to listen to anything. He just kind of said go. Yeah. But um, when I was running out of ideas, he would just come in and – be next to me and just kind of just do this, just do this and just beat on his chest and kind of direct me. And we basically started mostly with drums, no guitar, nothing, no music, just drums. Wow. And then he would hear something in the playback and just uh, go back in there and do that. And then do this other thing that's at six minutes and just put those together. And uh, when I would stick my hand up, change to the other thing. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was kind of it. And it was, it was crazy, but it was some of the most fun I've ever, I've ever had. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I, the record is very interesting. And I'd like to say, I'd like to be talking about it as in, like, you can, you know, play a sample from it and a plug and everything. But the way things are right now, it's going to come out. I'm just not really clear on when, you know. Right. Because uh, things are a little messy at the moment. But, I mean, I'm excited for this, man. This is this is a weird one. And I it's bet. not... I mean, you don't really get daughters out of it besides hearing Lex, but mm-hmm. even his approach is much different. Wow. That's really cool. I uh, It's something that I've always said, you know, like because I have like a jazzier kit down in Louisiana. When I play that, I feel like I'm more comfortable playing jazzier, kind of like, you know, 70s jazz funk stuff on it. And then when I play my bigger Ludwig kit, I feel more like Bonham bombast with it. So it's really interesting that, one, you didn't really have m- much of a sense of what you were walking into. There was a lot of spontaneity while you were tracking it. And thirdly, you had a very unorthodox drum set that altered your playing in addition to that so i imagine in now listening back to that are you you must be surprised at your own playing and the own and some of the things that that happened within that environment yourself right yeah and it's funny because there was moments where i'm kind of like mouthing to him while i'm playing about four minutes into this beat and i'd be like is that good and while i'm trying to talk and do this beat i kind of make a mistake Mm-hmm. He kept all the mistakes and isolated them and put them in other songs on purpose. And it's, it's pretty funny. And he did kind of the same thing to, to Evan. And uh, so he's like, hey, check it out. And they'd do some playback. And we'd be like, whoa, I'm, you know I'm fucking up there. He's like, yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, you know, he intentionally kind of kept all the mistakes. And uh, that was also funny. And I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> so right. it's it's raw. It's it's cool. Um he definitely had an idea of what he was doing that we weren't let in on because he trusted that we would play the way he wanted us to. Mm-hmm. So that was, you know, awesome. I didn't, I didn't think he'd uh, set us all up, but he did. But also I guess it, it takes some kind of trust to be able to do that. And I didn't know if you were to tell me that's what I'm walking into. I'm not sure I would have had the balls to do it. Right. Right. So it was, it was kind of cool to find out that I, still had the ability to just get in the hot seat and do something mm-hmm. and it was it was a lot of fun 
Super cool, man. And it's not as if, uh, you know, even with the last daughter's record, I would say that that is no, by, by no means, uh, the most, uh, orthodox record. It's, I would say the instrumentation and the parts and the writing and everything, all those moving parts are all pretty unorthodox, but this, uh, in particularly sounds almost like, uh, the sort of Tom Waits approach where, you know, everything, I guess, prior to like swordfish trombones, you know, the, which was more, uh, string arrangements, piano, et cetera. He started coming up with all this unusual instrument instrumentation and kind of more abstract songwriting and whatnot. Uh, and it sounds like Lex kind of embraced some of that with this. So, and I, I love the idea of hearing his voice over that sort of instrumentation. It, so it sounds like it's going to be, uh, it sounds really cool. Yeah, man. It's, it's definitely an interesting record. And once it, it's kind of like listening to a nightmare. <laughs> some daughter's things kind of daughter's stuff on that last record sometimes remind me of, you know, there's some soundtracky moments, you know, mm-hmm. some, interesting background music stuff this is just like listening to a, a hallucination or a nightmare uh, at wow. times and uh yeah i dig it and then i want to hear what he's going to try to do next you know is yeah. he going to do uh just all completely different vibe like what david bowie would just you know hire a brand new band after doing his biggest record or uh it's interesting i've played with this guy forever and i have no idea what he's got in him <laughs> you know <laughs> Totally. It's like, whoa, you did this? Yeah, so it, it was really cool. I'm proud of him, and definitely uh, one of the most fun things I've ever done. And glad we got it down, because like, we got it in, we got it finished, I don't know, just a few, I think he was still mixing when they did the whole, like, the ban on everything. Wow. So this is just blowing up while we were, or he was finishing. Wow. So. That's amazing, man. Sounds super cool. I can't wait to hear it. Uh, in, in regards to daughters going forward, is there uh, any rumblings of getting back into the studio when and if that's possible or, uh, to do another daughter's record? Yeah, man. I mean, we're, uh, again, we experienced some, some delays on everything we had intended to our timeline just went to shit, but, right. uh, the fall. Yeah. We have time booked in the fall to get in there and start. So, um, That'll be interesting. I hope we finish, you know, who knows, by the new year. Right. But um, we kind of take in, we plan to take in stages. That could change, but go in there, get a couple things tracked, and sit with it, and either ax it and write in the opposite direction of what we were hearing. Right. Or just add to it, you know. It's mm-hmm. kind of a piecemeal for the first uh, attempt or two mm-hmm. until we get what we're doing. And I think that's that's what comes with never really be in the same band from record to record, you know? Right. So, uh, yeah, we're going to try in in September if I'm allowed to travel at that point. So, yeah. Wow, man. I mean, last I heard, if you're from the South, including Texas, you can't go to like New York without having to do quarantine or something. Right. For a couple of weeks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow, man. Well, yeah. I mean, if I recall correctly with you won't get what you want, uh, that, that was kind of a piecemeal sort of not really totally certain where this song is going and then sort of edit, edit it together to become this thing. If I recall correctly, was that, that's kind of the way that record went down. Right. If I remember correctly, we kind of realized looking back at how we did that record, that there's kind of a pattern to it. And Mm -hmm. it's just, uh, because we can't be in the same city to just jam them out. Sometimes some songs just have to come together after reviewing, hating, changing, updating and, so you kind of get in there and just do the bare basics, you know, build the skeleton of the song. Yeah. And then, um, but we chose to kind of record it in an interesting way. So we can, we can try to edit it, at least the demo version of it. So well, mm-hmm. the snare hits there suck, man. Let's, let's move them over. So that meant I had to, you know, just do everything independently. So right. snare by itself, cymbals by themselves, but yeah. everything was independent. And yeah. We realize sonically we have a lot of room to actually really kind of play with this record. So nice. Uh, maybe we'll do that again. Maybe we won't, but I think we're going to start it that way. Yeah. Uh, again, we're we're just we're just jamming through uh, the internet right now. Yeah. Right. My God, man. Right on, dude. Well, again, you know, I hope that uh, this thing clears up soon enough for musicians, artists, everyone, just to get back to creating. uh, And uh, in the meantime, as we were talking about as well, you know, uh, hopefully everyone can make the best of it uh, in the tough times. But I certainly look forward to hearing uh, more daughters and hearing this Lex record. Hopefully you can uh, get back out there and start doing your thing soon, man. 
we'll hope you know everyone is uh, is good. This thing kind of, I mean, fuck. I don't even want to talk about it, but I just hope everything works out. Everybody kind of survives it. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, moving forward with what I remember of my life. <laughs> totally, man. All right, John. Well, shit, man. It was great talking to you again, and uh, best of luck going forward. And uh, I look forward to hearing uh, the, the the this project and the next one and all that good stuff. I'm a fan, my man. Thank you, buddy. It's good talking to you. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, John, for hanging. Looking forward to hearing these new records come out, especially that Alexis Marshall solo record. It's going to be some eclectic wildness, some odd instrumentation, some abstractions. We'll catch you all in the next one. Crash, bang, boom. <laughs>